Hey everyone, this is Tracy Friedlander. You're listening to Crushing Classical, redefining a thriving classical music career. Today on the show, I have Jennifer Williams, an opera director creating her own career as a director who's making bold moves and a big impact on the opera world. In Jennifer's projects, she takes on the idea of making a space for opera in our modern world, introducing other disciplines and mediums, as well as issues of today and the treatment of women in traditional opera. This is one of the things I was most interested in, considering that the main female character in most traditional operas does not have much luck. We dive into these topics and so much more. Let's get started. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you for being on Crushing Classical. Thank you so much for having me. So great to have you here. So you're an opera director, and we talked a while back about the uniqueness of what you do, because it's different from normal opera directing, right? Yes. Yes, definitely. I have a different take on, on what that means. Yeah, so I want to I wanna talk about this because I think it's so important. But why don't you just, at the beginning, just, just tell us um, a little bit about what you do. Um, well, my mission, as it were, as, as an artist, is to put opera in conversation with our 21st century present day world. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to do that. Conventionally, you know, most time of the time that means updating your production to our present day, which is fine. I think that's a good way to go about that. But I also, you know, like to like to disrupt that idea and think of other things sort of beyond that beyond that trope. So um, I like putting opera in conversation with technology and screens. I love video projections. I think, um, let's see, you know, screens and video are a huge part of our, our everyday lives. And so to come to a live performance event and be away from a screen is something extraordinary. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, I think engaging between those two poles of live performance and video, I think there's a lot in between those two poles that's interesting to, to explore and video projections are an interesting way to um, you know to delve into that uh, I also like thinking about space um, because one thing that differentiates uh, I think you know live performance at opera from Netflix and movies and the things we more frequently engage with uh, is this sort of three-dimensional aspect of it so I like um, let's see putting opera in conversation with things like immersive theater uh, and site-specific work as as well I mean because all of that you know exploring you know sense of place um, and the, the stories that are associated with places um, and either cultural, historical identities, I, I think are really important to put those in conversations with stories. But part of that too is also, you know, delving into the works themselves um, and asking what their implications are for, for our present moment as well. So a lot of different, <laughs> long answer to your question, but uh, <laughs> there are a lot of different, different ways to go about putting opera in conversation with our present day world. Right, so how did you get involved in opera? Because you told me you're, um, you were a violist. That is correct. Yes. Um, a lot of opera directors, uh, let's see, it's often a career change. I think I would say most opera directors I know are very often um, singers who have traditioned, uh, transitioned into opera directing. Oh, okay. Um, or uh, theater directors who have transitioned into opera directing. Um, I have a very strange story. <laughs> uh, I was a violist, actually. That was my, my passion. Um, I loved viola and really wanted to be a concert, viol uh, concert violist, like an uh, orchestral position. Uh -huh. um, and let's see, I think viola, <laughs> viola actually led me to composing and I started composing, I, I loved storytelling. So I started composing, uh, composing musicals and, and operettas of sorts. I, I wasn't really exposed to opera. So that wasn't something that was really in my, my lexicon, although my compositional idiom was more classical. Um, okay. But then, you know, I was directing my own works. I wanted to, you know, bring them to life. And then I, so I had a lot of things going at, at once for a while. And I think, um, you know, this sort of, I came to arrived at a moment where I, you know, felt like I, I needed to sort of focus on, on one to sort of achieve the level of excellence that I wanted. And I think in sitting in with that idea, I realized that my, my calling as it were was more as a storyteller and a director. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what, that's what I decided to pursue, but still, I still wanted nothing to do with opera. <laughs> so, um, you know, I was looking at theater. I was so really passionate about um, Shakespeare and uh, Greek, Greek drama. 
um, and really wanted that to be my focus and, and musical theater as well. Um, but it wasn't until I found myself in a, in a job at an opera company where I, um, really fell in love with the art form and, uh, wanted, <laughs> you know, wanted to uh, explore, explore that. How did you get there? I mean, how did you get a job in an opera company? Like what, what led you to that? Since you said like you were really not intentionally, were you intentionally avoiding opera? Like you, you didn't really like it at first or? Well, I felt uncomfortable. I mean, I really uh-huh. identify with a lot of audience members who, you know, I feel uncomfortable in opera houses, feel uncomfortable okay. just because of all of the, the, the myriad baggage that goes along with. Yeah. With, so there are a lot of reasons not to feel comfortable there. Yeah. Um, and I think, um, so I, I felt uh, like I didn't belong and I didn't, you know, have, I, it wasn't a place for me. So I was looking into theater, musical theaters, I said. So I was in sh- Chicago for my undergraduate l- work looking at, uh, I was doing a little assistant directing and some internships and things like that. And I had the opportunity to be um, an, an intern actually in the administration of an opera company, a wonderful company, Chicago Opera Theater. Um, and okay. it turns out in the course of my, my internship, uh, their resident assistant director was invited to a very prestigious graduate program. So there was suddenly a vacancy. Uh, it's quite funny because I didn't, I didn't know that. So I was offered this interview and I actually thought it was an informational interview. <laughs> the majority of it, I didn't realize it was a real interview. Um, <laughs> That's probably thought, a good you know, thing, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, and it, it went quite well. So uh, I had the great opportunity to be an assistant director on a, at a production of Dido and Aeneas um, and uh, to direct a, direct a scenes program with, with the young artists. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. So you sort of got plunged into it, not really expecting to be, you know, to be working in opera. So, you know, I want to talk about that for a second, that whole kind of uncomfortable feeling, because I wonder about how opera companies will will manage that problem, because I think it's it's common. You know, I think a lot of people don't really view opera as something that you would you would kind of put in the rotation of the things that you do generally, like the general population. I think it's more kind of, you could consider like a, the average show, like non-musician person who probably doesn't buy a whole lot of live experiences could probably see themselves at a concert for an orchestra easier than they could for an opera. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, I totally agree with that. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, quite honestly, uh, you know, when I talk to uh, you know, people in my my personal circle outside of outside of the upper world and outside of you know sort of yeah. the music world, a lot of people don't realize that opera still exists. Actually, that's a conversation you really? have very frequently. That it's this museum piece, and you can kind of go to the Met sometimes. But a lot of people don't even realize that they have local opera companies, even in fairly large cities. So there's some disconnect. Wow. Yeah. Um, let's see. I would, you know, yeah, I, I would um, definitely, that, that's a very frequent conversation that I have. Um, so I think that's something. Yeah. Cause I wonder it too. Yeah. I want, sorry to interrupt you. I just was yeah. wondering because, um, you know, now that you're really working deeply in this world, like, is this, do you, is this something that you feel is connected to the work you're doing, like making it more normal for people? Yeah, I think that's a really, that, that actually is the thrust of my mission because I felt that way. I think most of my family members and non-opera friends feel that way. Um, right. And I think that's, uh, that's not uncommon just to my, my own personal circle. I think that resonates with, with a lot of people. And I think that change to make it more inclusive is, um, is an important one if, if we want the, the art form to continue into future generations, which I will, but we have to do the work of making it. Um, you know, making it evolve with our, our times. And that doesn't mean, you know, jettisoning traditional repertoire. It just means thinking about who's in the audience and who do we want to be there and how do we make people feel welcome. Um, so, uh, you know, part of that is, you know, the, there's a big stigma about ticket sales. And I think a wonderful thing that opera companies have done is make ticket sales more accessible to more people. But a lot of people don't know that. Um, and they aren't going to click on a link to check what the ticket prices are because they're not, <laughs> I think, yeah. because, you know, the assumption is that, that they won't be able to afford them. Right. Um, so there's that, but there's also, you know, the, st- the way we are telling some of these stories um, and the way that they're being presented. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think that everything needs to be updated and, you know, made into a wild video production, pr- production all the time, but I do think we need to, um, 
you know, investigate why these, what makes these stories immortal, right? Yeah. So that's, so that, so that ties into the work you do, right? Like Mm -hmm. that you're kind of, you're either changing it to be more modern, modern and accessible in the way that people would expect, you know, a production to be a live production, but also how do you, how do you, um, how do you do this so that you can target the things that you find the most important? Mm -hmm. Um, I start with the question, why this story? Why now? Okay. Um, because I think, you know, any concept has to be rooted in the score and the story for it to, to have meaning. Um, so that, you know, from there, it really depends on, on the work, of course. But I think that's where my ideas begin to flow. Does this something, you know, what, uh, what kind of visual world do I create? What are the priorities? If this is... Um, Let's see if I, if, you know, the story is marriage of Figaro, I think, you know, one reason when I ask the question, why the story, why now I class struggle comes to mind. So how do I create a visual world that's about class struggle? Um, and then who are the different voices within class struggles? I think another interesting aspect of that work is there's class struggle. There's also gender, um, uh, you know, the sort of gender war within that. Um, and those are both happening at the same time. And the fact that the composition doesn't pick one, that it's these two registers happening at the same time is what makes it fascinating. Um, and so, you know, be, being, um, I think, looking at the score through the eyes of that, through the lens of that question, why the story, why now, um, I think is really essential. That's amazing. So you're really like zooming out and looking at the whole context of the story. Exactly. And then figuring out like, how does this play into the things that we are dealing with in today's world? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because I think, you know, of course, you know, these works are a mirror uh, that we hold to nature. Yes. But we have to, I mean, what makes that metaphor so interesting, (laughs) uh, you know, both in, um, in the Plato and the Shakespearean today is that, you know, the mirror has a frame. So it's a frame that you're putting around something. So there's no such thing as a neutral, objective storytelling. There's always some sort of frame. So where are you placing the frame? Mm. So would you say that um, this is often thought about while directing opera? Like, or are you taking a unique kind of approach to it? Well, let's see. I don't know. It's hard for me to speak for, for other directors because there are a lot of different a lot of different approaches, um, uh-huh. as many different approaches as there are people probably. But for me, I start with that question and then I start working my way down to the moment where I, work, I, I arrive in the rehearsal room with singers because the next step of my process, um, well before I first start the first day of rehearsals is that um, I work with the design team. So I have a group of designers I, I you know, work with regularly. Um, let's see. And then we have a meeting and uh, we start exploring this work together and decide what this world looks like. Um, and then by the time I get to the rehearsals, we're really delving into the details uh, of, of what characters are saying when. <laughs> um, uh-huh. you know, we have that, that kind of frame in place. Awesome. Awesome. So um, you and I had talked before about the roles, um, like generally women's roles in opera. And, you know, that's really something that really stands out to me when I think about opera is like how women are generally, like the characters of the women in operas are generally treated. It's really surprising when you, when you really take a look, right? Mm -hmm. Like the main, the main character is always like, (laughs) being killed usually at the end. Right. Yes. Usually her life is terrible. Usually men are abusing her in some way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so like, this is, what do you think of this as far as like, you know, the future of opera and what you want to, like the conversation you want to have around this issue? I think it's a necessary conversation. Um, I think it's, we're sort of having it in some ways right now, but um, I think it's a conversation that we can have in a more meaningful way. And that includes in the productions that, um, you know, that are being created. So, you know, as you, as you mentioned, there's this dying soprano trope in opera. Yeah. It's really unfortunate. And I think on the, the laundry list of reasons that I found opera off-putting. Um, and I think we need to find ways... Um, not just compositionally, but also, you know, for me as a director, um, and when I collaborate with with singers as well about how to find 
ways, um, let's see, to, you know, to tell these stories and, you know, create these characters that reflect, uh, you know, these 21st century reflections, but also the reality of, of women and what it was like to be a woman at that, you know, in those time periods, but also, you know, uh, with a more honest, honest view of what that, that is. So sometimes that means, you know, you know, we're you know, presented with some things compositionally that are really difficult, like this this fetish really of of killing off women. But I think if you reframe that as an obstacle rather than a condition, that's something I say all the time in my rehearsals. Because uh, there's a tendency of playing, you know, affliction kind of more as a condition, as an adjective. But yeah. as soon as you reframe that as an obstacle and um, something that they're fighting against, a conflict as it were, a conflict is a center of trauma to begin with, so you can't lose with that, right? Um, <laughs> but all of a sudden you have a character who is more active, um, who's in conflict. She's not sort of this background condition um, or an, you know, um, an extension of a male character's, uh, you know, fantasies or um, let's see, uh, uh, let's see, yearning for his lost youth or something. I mean, you know, the, all of those things, that's not helpful. But I mean, when we play them as active people, all of a sudden that's a starting point for a more active conversation. But there are also ways, you know, to bring that into the designs of productions as well. Um, and the actual concept that, that the director brings to the table. I mentioned, you know, my interest, just my interest in video earlier. I mean, one reason why I'm very interested in that is there's something deeply inherently psychological about film. Um, and, and video as well. And so rather than just using video projections as a kind of backdrop, <laughs> cheap scenery, right? <laughs> um, or screensaver syndrome, it's another thing I've, <laughs> that's another, uh, I think, common use of, of video where it's just sort of abstracting the background. But I think I, using it as a way to distill um, a particular character's thoughts, emotions, um, actions uh -huh. either into concrete images or into something that's really psychological in terms of, you know, um, uh, sort of an abstract, very thoughtful, um, let's see, uh, design as well. But it's also focused on a character that becomes more interesting. And I found that to be a really effective way to amplify the voices of uh, those who are traditionally kind of marginalized, especially women characters. Can you give an example of that? Like, how have you done it? Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Well, I did. A, I directed a production of La Boheme a couple of years ago, okay. um, and let's see. In Mimi, the final scene. Um, let's see. I, Mimi's death scene. Uh, I used video projections. Let's see. That and it was totally focused on her. Um, okay. So the, my concept for the projections is that let's see. It was very um, the whole uh, all of it. The production was um, let's see. Uh, very painterly in, in very in that regard. So it was sort of like the uh -huh. walk of the Bohemians was expanded into the entire space, and we saw uh, saw Paris through their eyes. Um, cool. But in the last act, all of it was black and white. So sort of this photo negative of the world in which they lived. But it, once um, once Mimi enters, <laughs> you know, enters the the picture uh, in the last act, all of it suddenly changes. And so the thrust of it is, I was really interested in um, the very visceral experience of death and what it means for um, the body to break down. And so the designer I collaborated to create, um, let's see, this this abstract texture that was like um, evoked, you know, neurons slowly breaking down and then cells breaking down. And so it had this very visceral thing that was very tied to her. But then we'd also have fragments of, you know, just as you know, happens in the in the score, um, fragments from the first act that, you know, that would uh, let's see, fade in this very faint, blurry way, um, a bit like, you know, so basically creating this sense of, of brain damage, right? And that would fade away like it was this uh, thing that she was just a, an idea, a picture she was reaching for and couldn't, couldn't quite make, um, Interesting. make whole. Um, and so, so it was, you, really, you, know, you really bring it to life on different levels by using the video. Yes. Yeah. That's cool. So, so essentially you're, are you empowering the women by maybe in these traditional stories that you can't really change or someone's going to be like, wait a second, Tosca, she didn't die in the end. She, you know, she murders the men and she lives happily ever after. Like, I don't know if you could do that. Right. People would be like, this isn't the real thing. Well, I see you can't, but then that's an adaptation. That's a different thing. And I think okay. adaptations are great. I actually am, am working on an, an adaptation. Um, 
of Carmen that I'm directing in Hong Kong in a couple of months. Um, but that's a fundamentally, I think, different because you're actually creating a different text in that way, right? Okay. So what does that mean? So that means you can, if it's an ad- adaptation, that means you can change the story, you can change the ending? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people, the line between production concept and adaptation can be a little, a kind of a fine one. Um, okay. But to my mind, when you are making dramaturgical changes to the story, that becomes a, an adaptation. Cool. So yeah. are you allowed to tell us what happens in that version of Carmen? <laughs> I am. A, I'm not actually. You have to come to Hong Kong to find out. Oh, man. <laughs> um, or okay. follow my social media. And if you can't make it out to Hong Kong, because we will have so many photos and videos. Um, let's see. But, uh, you know, to my mind, uh, to begin with the adaptation, the, the company, one of the company I'm working with more than music hall asked me to collaborate with their music director in creating this adaptation of Hong, uh, of Carmen set in Hong Kong, um, in a more, not our present moment, but an imagined, imagined future is what, what I landed on. Um, Ooh, cool. And so, yeah. So, I mean, that uh, a lot of, there are a lot of commonalities, um, between the stories. I mean, the, the, story, the story of Timeless, and I think resonates with, with all kinds of geographies and, and moments, um, including, uh, you know, Hong Kong. Um, so it's set in Hong Kong, it, it's the triad gangs. Um, and so at the end, you know, I wanted to find a way, uh, I mean, my, my goal was to find a way um, to, since the whole concept was that Carmen is a, a modern woman and that everyone in the audience can look at her and say, I'm Carmen, um, and feel, feel that kind of connection. I, you know, it felt like the, the traditional ending, especially since we're, um, you know, the whole project is to sort of deconstruct the work in this way. Um, it, it did feel appropriate to have a, a different alternative ending than the, than the obvious one. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and also I should mention too, part of, oh, it's also being compressed. So it's 90 minutes, the whole. The whole oh, wow. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's another piece, right? Because operas are traditionally really long. They are. Yeah. <laughs> and that can be a wonderful thing. I mean, first of all, I, I don't agree with the whole idea that in our, our contemporary time, we have short attention spans. I mean, we've all been to watch Netflix, right? Yeah. <laughs> we, have, we have very long attention spans when we want them to be. We have, um, we're very busy and we don't have a lot of time. And so if we want to try something new, it's a really big ask to um, ask a new audience member to give up three and a half hours of their time for something they might not like. Right. Um, and that's fair, right? Um, yeah. So I think, you know, there's something I, you know, I like to explore the idea of micro operas. I think this, you know, this compressed project I'm working on is, is quite interesting. I also, let's see, you know, I'm, I'm working on this other project right now and that's um, premiering in January and I am, I'm staging Strauss's Four Last Songs. And so this is a 25 minute performance and I'm, um, let's see, basically, basically approaching the Four Last Songs as this, this micro opera. Um, and there are other micro operas that have been written. Jonathan Dove has written um, another, um, a number of very compelling works that are sometimes, you know, 20 minutes long. Um, <laughs> and I think, you know, that can be a really great way. So it's like watching a little episode of, on Netflix, right? Yeah. Um, so you can experience something without having the whole three and a half hour commitment. And if you, if you want to go watch a three and a half hour opera after that, you know, that's an option as well. But I think offering audiences a variety of experiences yeah. you know, will help us tap into a variety of audience members. Absolutely. So I love that, that these, that the things that you're saying right now are part of your work and thinking about the future of opera and growing the audience for opera is part of how you approach directing opera. That's really important. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's necessary for, for a contemporary world. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So, um, with the audience building piece, because this is something I talk about a lot. Um, are you sharing your opinions on, on the, all these things? Like, do you blog about it or, um, do anything like that? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I'm sharing them right now. Um, (laughs) So let's see, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I've, you know, had the opportunity to, uh, you know, chat on, on wonderful platforms, including, uh, you know, here and now, but um, let's see. Uh, I think, you know, I'm not really a blog person. I tend to be very vocal on social media about uh-huh. the that I'm doing. Um, and let's see. Um, I, let's see. I also, uh, I, I, 
spoken with with um, other other um, let's see I was recently I did a webinar for example um, on a similar topic about creating empowered representations of, of women uh -huh. um, with modern modern singer um, oh cool yeah and I let's see chatted with Opera Wire recently as well um, on these topics particularly a production I was working on at the time that was a world premiere called Backwards from Winter um, which was a monodrama for for soprano um, in which a, a, a woman gets to speak for a whole hour in which she is not interrupted what an extraordinary thing right <laughs> uh, yeah that's, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah, the, actually, the work is sorry that's what the piece is? She's, yes, she's yeah. 60 minutes. Um, a 60 minute monodrama about a woman um, who loses her, her love in a car accident. And it traces the, pro uh, the progress of her grief backwards chronologically through the lens of the seasons. Ooh. Yeah, it's for soprano, electronic cello, and electronics. Interesting. Who wrote it? Yeah. Uh, Douglas Neans. That's fantastic. Yeah, Juanita Rockwell is the, the librettist. And where, where was that performed? In New York City with Center for Contemporary Opera. Okay. Um, that's, you know, actually, that's another uh, example of, of work I love to do. I do a lot of work with contemporary opera, naturally. It's a really great... That's actually, you know, to better answer your question, I think a lot of my, my work as a director, too, um, in helping... Um, disrupt the idea of how we portray women um, happens, you know, within my work in contemporary opera as well to have the opportunity to collaborate with composers and we can all work right. together, <laughs> um, you know, to bring new stories to life, I think, which are just as important as um, revisiting some of some of the traditional ones. Yes. Okay. That's so interesting. So I'm starting to get the world of it now. It's like, it's like as a director, you're running in sort of alternative circles whereas you know maybe some of the more traditional opera houses might not be so open to to doing something a little less less than than historic or ha ha that it was historically done Is well that it depends i mean i just uh let's see i was at the met last night for Ocknaughton. um so i mean there are a lot of really interesting works um you know happening right now i think there are companies that are interested in uh presenting uh, alternative this is uh, you know alternative tellings i said in there are different ways of doing that um okay with some of the contemporary rep as well um i think one of the challenges is how to do that and create new productions um because that's sort of more of a financial challenge right. uh, as well i think um you know some of these compressed adaptations for example like this uh this carmen that i'm directing uh, which we're developing to tour, you know, that can be a great thing to have in second spaces as well. Um, but I think, you know, if you look around the world too, there are a lot of, you know, especially outside of the US as well, there are a lot of really great examples of how to tell, um, you know, how to tell these, these classic works in more uh, contemporary ways and on in larger scales as well. I mean, a lot of my work more at the very recently has been in smaller and alternative spaces, but, and which I, I like doing, but, um, Let's see, you know, there are ways to do that in larger spaces as well. And I look forward to doing that kind of work in the future. Awesome. So how do you connect with people for your next projects? Is it just like word of mouth? I mean, like you said, you're, you're an opera wire and, mm -hmm. and different magazines and stuff. Is it, is it just like a director's network sort of thing? Um, I think that's, that's true. Part of it. I mean, in order, you know, you, I, uh, I think when, in, in doing adventurous work, people want to talk to you. That's kind of you know, what I found. So let's see, Opera Sense is another um, group that I've been chatting with recently and a few other things coming up as well. But, um, you know, I, I do, uh, let's see, I'm pretty active on social media. I think, you know, that's part of the world in which we live as well. And I think we consume a lot of information on Facebook and Instagram too. So I yeah. think that's um, an important way to connect with people. And I, you know, I've gone into to interviews with, with companies and people are quite familiar with things via social media as well. Um, but a lot of it is, you know, also word of mouth. Um, you know, whenever I go to performances, you inevitably run into people and, you know, it's important to chat up what you're doing and people want to know, you know, what, what I'm, I'm doing next as well. If, you know, they're, I've yeah. connected with them in the past. Um, yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So, um, so who like in the opera world right now who's who's really inspiring you right now oh that's a great question i mean um 
I'm lucky that I've been able to work with a lot of really amazing um, women mentors as well. And there are a lot of people who are interested in disrupting the way that we traditionally approach opera. I've been working with Beth Morrison projects uh, for the last, I guess, year or so, um, doing various uh, productions with them, including directing a double bill uh, up to world premieres. Um, let's see, world premiere offers at National Sawdust in Brooklyn. That's mm -hmm. a company and artistic leader uh, that's been really inspiring to work with, who's, you know, thought about, it's basically launched this whole black box opera movement that um, with contemporary stories that reflect, um, you know, modern pressing issues about social justice um, and the human experience. But I think, you know, there are a lot of really inspiring leaders at uh, a lot of regional companies as well that serve, um, let's see, not necessarily a more traditional audience, but there's a, a part of their audience that is more traditional and then they're also, you know, pushing into other areas and developing uh, more progressive audiences as well and reaching out to people who, um, <laughs> let's see, who don't, you know, normally come to the opera. I worked with Austin Opera uh, with Annie Burridge a couple of, uh, let's see, recently. And um, let's see, she, <laughs> one of my favorite things is that you know, she launched this initiative where there is a taco truck uh, on the, uh, let's see, on the pavilion of the opera house. And, you know, which is just, a, you know, great important part of the Austin um, cultural yeah. <laughs> and restaurant scene there's a huge restaurant scene there and so yeah. uh, you know she brought it into the upper house so before and or <laughs> during intermission and or after you can get your your taco from the taco truck um and that's part of you know that's part of going to the opera and i think that's that's amazing to put opera in conversation with the community in that way oh yeah that would be a draw for me <laughs> <laughs> i Are love tacos you're directing a show <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's great. Mm -hmm. So if you could, do you have a dream project, like something that you wish you could adapt and like what you would do, like, since it's not like in real life, then you could tell us like how you would change the ending. Like, is this stuff that you kind of dream about? Um, yeah, actually. And I have, <laughs> it's funny you say that I have a whole file of, of paper projects, um, which are designs for, for productions that I would love to do that I'm, you know, regularly uh, showing companies and, and asking. Yeah. Um, but I've also, you know, honestly, I've, I've kind of taken initiative with some of these things too. Um, and I've started exploring grant opportunities and producing, um, you know, producing on my, my own with the help of grants and donations, all of those things to get the work done and hopefully, you know, um, collaborate later with co-producers um, and take the initiative with creating opportunities and creating works. I'm just not, I'm not the kind of person who's going to wait around for, you know, an invitation. I think yeah. I really know um, invitations. There's just, um, <laughs> there's just making it, making it happen. Um, I think especially for, for women directors too, I think waiting around for an invitation is just not, <laughs> not a right. proactive way to go. Um, so actually the, uh, my upcoming production, I'm staging four last songs, um, as this micro opera, but it's, uh, an immersive multimedia installation. Um, there's this amazing space I discovered uh, in Manhattan called Be Alchemical. It's this white box space and haven't had opera there before. And it's, um, I just fell in love with it and I had to do something there. And so I've decided to stage the four last songs as this immersive experience. So the audience is interspersed in the world of, um, uh, of the soprano. And, the, and it's a woman who is at the, the end of her life. And so the space is this expression of um, what the end of, end of experiences and so it's what it means to be on the border between this life and the next and that exploring what that border itself might might look like and I'm doing that you know I think the the idea of a white box I think is very evocative to me because it's at once something has been erased but it's at the same time it's a blank page so that mm -hmm. just seems like the perfect poetic metaphor um, and then let's see I'm bringing video into the equation but it's not sort of traditional you know park on just sort of project on one wall it's going to be more mobile um, and so it's really this 360 experience and the audience is at the center of it. It's all happening inches away from them. Um, so that's, you know, a dream project that I'm, I am making come to life uh, as, as we speak. Yeah. That's awesome. Is there a full orchestra too? Um, no, we're doing it with piano and my hope is in, in future co-productions that we can expand into a slightly larger space and then have a yeah. full orchestra and then have the orchestra be part of the picture as well and not just kind of in a corner, but really be, 
be part of the work. I think, you know, being a violist actually has, has um, you know, influenced my life in a lot of ways. And I think part of it is that I love thinking about, you know, other ways to, I do like including the orchestra when, <laughs> when possible. Um, I directed a St. Matthew Passion uh, in Cincinnati when I was a graduate student in which I pulled uh, orchestra members on stage who had became characters and extensions of characters. And um, actually for this double bill that I directed for Beth Morrison projects at National Sawdust, one of the pieces is Mary Motorhead by Emma, Emma Halloran. Um, the score featured, um, let's see, electric electric guitar and tenor saxophone. So obviously I had to bring them on stage, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, that's so fun. And it's a scene in a disco. And so it's so fun to collaborate with musicians and see how they think about um, or instrumental musicians and think of it, see how they think about movement um, and how their bodies relate to music making. Um, Let's see, and obviously as a violist, I'm very sensitive to that's, you know, when you have something in your hands, it's a different thing. Right. Um, but it's just, you know, it, it was really fun to work with uh, both of them to create characters uh, <laughs> and see what other types of movement can come in from that. So I think in future iterations of the four last songs, um, that's something I would love to explore is how to, you know, um, use the, the French horn, for example, let's see, to, to bring that into the equation and how do those become characters and, and voices dramatically. Well, of course, I would hope that you would do that with the horn. All right, yes. <laughs> of course, you'd have to. That would have to be your chosen instrument for sure. Oh my gosh, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, and so are there any projects where you, like, you haven't started working on yet that like you just really want, like you really want to redo something that's nagging at you that you want to do? Oh yeah, I have a whole paper project for Don Giovanni right now. Um, let's see. And I have a couple, actually I have several different versions of it for different spaces. Um, I have, uh, let's see, a proscenium version and I also have a black box uh, installation version as well. And I think, you know, I have, that's, that's a piece I think, you know, as we were saying earlier, this, this whole idea of um, how we portray women and their experiences yeah. is a conversation that we, that needs to be had right now in a, in yeah. a meaningful way. Um, and I think that also needs to happen with the repertoire. And so there are a lot of Don Giovanni's happening, which is great. And I think, you know, and it's a really, that's a difficult conversation to have with that piece. But, um, you know, for me, uh, let's see, I think I would love to do a production that starts with the, the um, survivor's experiences. And I see the work as a confluence of, of trauma nightmares um, and uh, survivors who are sorting through those nightmares to find, um, let's see, find some kind of reconciliation. Um, yeah. Let's see. And it's the, the joining of those forces and the confluence and intersections of those, those nightmare experiences that are really interesting to me. So I have a lot of ideas about how to bring that to, to life, um, particularly with movement and how to extend, um, let's see, extend the women's experiences and women's psyches into, let's see, the chorus and um, let's see. Uh, I have uh, ideas for uh, <laughs> extensions of their nightmares as, as well, um, particularly through dancers and things like that. But um, yeah, I think, but that doesn't necessarily have, you don't have to do that with updating. I think you can start with a traditional framework and um, deconstruct it in order to have a more meaningful conversation. So part of the, part of my design actually is that there's this, this collision between contemporary dress and contemporary um, let's see stage design uh, for the the set and period and so they've, it's like they've collided uncomfortably <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think for That's me when I, I think about design and, and what this a space looks like I think what's extraordinary to me about opera especially is that it's this this site in which um, the possible can encounter the impossible um, and that challenges our audiences to help imagine you know, what their reality could be like. Um, and that's a really important thing. Um, and so that's one reason why I like unpacking realism a bit and putting that in conversation, in collision <laughs> uh, with things like surrealism and um, expressionism and other, other modes of, um, you know, other modes of visualities. I love your creativity. You have so many ideas and they're all like just from all different, you know, areas of art. It's really great. <laughs> Thank you. I love it. And I was going to ask you if you have something that you'd like to promote coming up, but I think we really got a good idea about that with the four last songs one. 
When does that concert happen? That's January 15th in New York. Okay, so. Well, yes. It was that, how do you get tickets? Like, I want to make sure that I, you know, I'm able to put something in the show notes. Thank you. Um, let's see. I have a, I've created a page on my own site, www.jenniferwilliams.com. Okay. Slash Strauss for last songs with dashes in between each of those words. Um, okay. And there's a page there that details the project and um, the amazing team that um, that's part of it. Uh, and the, uh, let's see, as well as how to, uh, let's see, reserve your tickets and also how to support it and make a tax deductible donation. That's great. And then, and then you've got the Hong Kong um, Carmen coming up too. Yes. Yes. When does that happen? Um, let's see. That is going to be happening in the summer and the, the company is going to be announcing the, the date for that soon. That's great. We have to that because of, um, let's say the social unrest that was originally mm. planned for this fall, but it's now happening over the summer. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm glad it sounds like it's going to be really exciting. And plus you get to go over and be in Hong Kong for a while, which will be fun. Oh yeah, I actually had the wonderful opportunity. The company actually flew me out to see Hong Kong um, in order to create the adaptation, um, so that I could help create an adaptation that actually reflects <laughs> reflects the reality yeah. of in Hong Kong. And so I spent a week there, and different members of the company would take me to different areas of the city. And so I had this extraordinary experience to experience the city through the eyes of um, people who have lived there their whole lives or much of their adult lives, um, <laughs> which is great. So you know, I'm used to traveling alone. So <laughs> It's so nice to explore, you know, explore with someone who's, um, people who, who know the city so well. That's uh, so that true. Was, yeah. Yeah. Especially a place like, like China where it feels, I mean, I know from being in China, it feels really different over there. So. Yeah. Yeah. And to hear, I think, you know, locals, some you know, perspectives on what, what it means to be in Hong Kong right now, vis-a-vis -vis mainland China, that was all very interesting. True. Yes. Oh, oh man. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. I'm really excited to hear all that you've got going on in your world and how you're impacting the opera world. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> I'm Tracy Friedlander, and you've been listening to the Crushing Classical podcast. You can follow Crushing Classical on Instagram and Facebook at Crushing Classical. If you haven't yet, you can go to Apple Podcast and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Your reviews help others to find these conversations. Thanks for listening.